Well, uh, I'm going to start teaching today, and this is a subject that uh, really will either rock your world or make you mad. One of the two, but it's, it's okay. Either way, it's fine. Uh, but I pray that the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I pray that you open our hearts and ears and cause us to understand and to hear what you want to say to your church today. I want to thank you that we are your beloved. You, you are the bridegroom. We are the bride. I want to thank you that we are the apple of your eye. I want to thank you that we are in you and you are in us and we're in the Father. I want to thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, my Bible is open here. I just opened it while Rebecca was sharing with us. Verse 4 in Ephesians chapter 1. And let's say verse 3 starts by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And now verse 4, he starts enumerating the blessings. In other words, it makes a statement and then it starts breaking it down for us. It says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world. And I think it's, it's worth looking at this, understanding that God is outside of time and space and that he has made the decision to adopt us before the world began. And you probably heard me say this. But here's the other thing that I, I, I need to say to you. There's a, there's a parable. How many of you are familiar with Matthew 13? There's a parable that talks about um, about the pearl of great price. You know, a lot of people wonder why, why did Jesus pick, uh, out of all the jewels in the world, he picked the pearl. I think that one of the reasons is that the pearl is basically made, and when it's, when it's done, it is a finished product. You see, a diamond has, it needs to be, how can I say, uh, finished. It's not a finished product. They, they need to work on it. They need to chip off some stuff in order to bring its beauty out. When you talk about an, uh, a pearl, it is a finished product. But if you know, you probably know this, that a pearl is, is, created through pain and the sand and, and, and whatever is in, inside the oyster they, they go against each other and there is, there is some blood that, uh, that, that is shed there and there is, that's how the pearl is, is made so knowing that he has picked us handpicked us before the foundations of the world as well as the Lamb of God was crucified, was given before the foundations of the earth or at the foundations of the earth, depending on what translation you read, okay? But do you realize that when you were born, you were already born with the imprints of the blood of the Lamb of God? This is a powerful thing. And you're valuable in His eyes. He handpicked you. And if you really want a purpose for your life, this would be it. All that he ever wanted was for us to be part of his family, for us to be his children, for us to be dependent on him. Now, I know we live in a world where independence is so much encouraged. and uh, We don't want people to depend. Uh, but when it comes to God, this really was the, the original sin, was Adam wanting to be on his own, wanting to bring life on his own, leave us apart from God. And truth is that apart from God, we all die. For we were not created 
to sustain ourselves. We were created to depend on him who created us. We were, he is the head, we are the body. He is the vine, we are the branch. I know I'm repeating these things, but, but it's important. And that will keep us humble. Because when we know that the king of the universe is our father, then the creator of all things is our father, you could become a little bit proud, you know. But and and it, there's a certain amount that's okay to be to be pumped up that that you're the son of the king, you're the daughter of the king of heaven. That 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 he is, in reality, your daddy. But at the same time, we know that we are dependent on him, and this will keep us humble. This this will. We understand our place. We understand that apart from him, we can do nothing, right? So today, I'm going to talk about a subject, and, and it does connect to identity. Pretty much everything in Scripture has to do with identity. See, we don't believe in a God that is somewhere far apart from us and remote and reluctant to talk to us. We believe that this, the Bible talks about the relationship between men and God, between God and man. And this is really what it comes down to. And there's a subject that is vast. I mean, it, that there's a lot to say about it. Uh, so I don't know that I can finish it all in, in one Sunday. Obviously not. And, and if I'm done talking, you could add to it, obviously, because there's just so much about this. And I tell you, the religious people, they made out of this subject something that it shouldn't have been, but religion does what it does. And we're here to be free from religion. Amen? So I'm going to start talking today about intercession. And the minute I say the word intercession, your mind immediately goes to prayer. How many of you heard about the intercessory prayer? you did how many of you heard about people that travail and they they uh, they uh, intercede and they um, but, but but see the idea really comes from the translation the english translation no, not the greek translation that the bible was written in uh, the new testament but um, in english it means the action of interceding on behalf of another now, I'm here to present to you that that's not what that means in Greek. Okay, so it's translated as such, and I know how they, they got to that conclusion. Uh, but before we, you know, we, we know that intercession is really be, between humanity and God. That's basically what religion will teach. That's what we believe, that um, intercessory uh, that intercession is something that's, that's very important, but we need to know first who God is. Uh, it's very vital. It's very important. And, and I'm going to start by uh, using a text in Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. It says this. I am... The eternal God, this is God speaking, God said to Moses, right? Verses 14, 15, and 16. And it says, so tell them, now Moses is saying, what should I tell them? What is your name? What do I give the people of Israel when I go see them? Tell them that the Lord, whose name is I Am, has sent you. This is my name forever. This is how God introduces himself, and he says, this is my name forever. This doesn't change. And it is the name that people must use from now on. In other words, God says, this is how I want you guys to call me. I want you to call me I am. Call together the leaders of Israel and tell them that the God who was <coughs> worshipped by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to you. It's very interesting that he doesn't say, you know that God changed Jacob's name to Israel. But he doesn't say, 
I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which means supplanter. I'm the God of the supplanter too. She doesn't exclude Jacob or the life that Jacob had before. All right? Well, that's, that's good news, is that he does not, he never excludes our life before we got to know him, right? So this God appeared to you. Tell them, I have seen how terribly they are being treated in Egypt. So that's what I, I, I thought, I started thinking about this. What does, why God wants us to call him I am? And what does really his name mean? Because it's very important for us to understand, right? He doesn't say, uh, he basically says I am. Now this is eternal. It's not just the God of history past. He is not becoming in any way. He is not just the God of future or the God of history. He is ever present. So when he says, I am, what he means is, I am always present. I live in the present. I am now. I'm not becoming something. It's not just that I was something, though. For our understanding, John says in Revelations 1 8, who was, who is, who was, and is to come. But see, he is outside of time and space, so that means that he is eternal. The name I am implies the fact that God is ever existing or he is eternal. So understanding that part is, is, is vital when we relate to him, when we, uh, when we talk to God. Now, the other thing is this. See, when I say I am, usually if I tell you I am, I'll, I'll probably tell you an address where I'm at. A location. I'll tell you I'm at the rim preaching the gospel now because I can only be in one place at a time. Are you following what I'm saying? I can tell you I am at Diamond Ridge at 94 trillion court. That's where I live. But see, I'm limited. I am there. I can't be somewhere else at the same time. Neither can you. Not physically, okay? But when God says, I am, or I am that I am, it means he's everywhere at the same time. It shows his omnipresence. And he doesn't say notice. He doesn't introduce himself as, I have that I have. Because, oh, well, look, I have some tea. Here, right? I have a certain amount of tea. I have tea. Now, if I take a sip, now I have less tea. If he said, I have that I have, it means that at some point in time he had more, and in the future he, he might have less. But if I say, I am tea, it means I'm the source. It means that no matter how much you drink of me, he says, I am the living water, right? He doesn't say, I have living water. It means that no matter how much living water he gives out, how much life he gives out, he has the same amount of life in himself as before. So do, you, do we see that the, all of the attributes of God, have no boundaries. As it reminds me of, of a time I, I went to a, a restaurant to have breakfast. 
uh, by so I'm getting there and, and they take their sweet time to arrange tables and do this and do that and do the other and I'm, I'm waiting you know I'm just I was the only one in line at this time so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting you know. they do whatever they do and when the lady comes back she looks at me she says man your patience knows no boundaries I thought man that's the best the best compliment I heard today <laughs> you <know? laughs> so <laughs> because he basically she basically identified man this is this is not normal uh, other people would have complained about this so but when we think about God all of his attributes that's why I love saying that he holds the monopoly on joy and on peace and on love he is omnipresent uh, he is almighty it means that he has no limit to his strength the more strength he exerts the more strength he has I mean it, it's the same amount of strength and it is almighty right so all of his attributes and let me just uh, read about uh, a few attributes right there's all of his attributes are to infinity his love is unlimited has no boundaries right his grace has no boundaries his kindness his goodness has no boundaries his wrath has no boundaries and you're gonna say uh oh we're in trouble uh, his omniscience has no limits uh, his omnipresence obviously has no limits. But I want to stop and, and just talk for just a minute about his wrath. Because I don't know about you, but usually in the past, when I would read about the wrath of God, <laughs> uh, let me read to you a, a little passage, okay? Um, it's in Ephesians 2. And I would read and quickly I would go over it. <laughs> I said, I don't want to talk about the wrath of God. I don't want to think about this, you know. Whatever it is, you know, let, let, me, let, me, let me just go over to the next verse. Uh, chapter 2. Uh, let me see in, in, in Ephesians. Oh, I'm, I'm going to read to you out of King James now. So It says here, among whom... Also, we all had our conversation in times past. So our behavior in times past has been like that, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So I would go right over it. I was that in the past. I'm no longer there. Thank God. Okay. But if you look at this, look at verse 4. It says here, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved and has raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So now, understanding the fact that God is love, okay, and his love is unlimited or has no boundaries, when I look at this text, it says, but God who is rich in mercy, and Dolores was talking about the mercy of God, right? He reached us. He saved us. He uh, brought us to him. He raised us together with Christ and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know what that shows me? It shows me that the wrath of God is really the passion of God to pursue you or to protect you. Oh, let me give you an, 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 an example. When 
Remember, I, I think I talked last time about the lost sheep. And the shepherd makes the statement, or the scripture makes the statement, that the shepherd will search for the lost sheep until he finds her. In other words, he's relentless. He's not going to give up. He's going to do everything within his power to get that sheep back. That's his passion. That is the wrath of God is not against you. It's, a, it's, it's manifested towards you, but it's his passion for you to bring you to him. The other understanding would be, and well, I will say this, if anyone would attack my family, whether it's my wife, Michaela, or my children, I would step between the attacker and my family. I would be willing to give my life with no, no second thoughts. They would see a different Pastor John, <laughs> right? Well, I remember years back, Harmony was little, and she was um, just riding her like two-wheeler, uh, whatever, uh, this, like, like a little scooter, and I was with Mickey. Mickey was on a longer leash, so uh, he was obviously catching with her. And and she's riding through the neighborhood, and I'm walking behind, right? And there's this huge white dog charging towards Harmony. And Mickey is just such a nice and kind and and mellow dog. But you, I have seen the wrath of Mickey. <laughs> He's got between the dog and Harmony and was barking. I mean, I thought, what happened? And the big dog backed off. Yeah. And, and I'm going, really? This day? But, and the owner called off the dog, obviously, you know, but um, she was watering the grass or whatever. I don't know why he let him loose like that, but. Uh, but, I mean, Harmony was about to be attacked. I was too far to get between, but Mickey was close, so he got in. So, you see, that is the wrath to protect. So God's wrath is manifested in, in, in pursuing us and protecting us. And I'm sure it's more than that, but that's for the sake of time. I'm just limiting it here. You could meditate more to see how the wrath of God uh, manifests towards you. But it's very clear to me that in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks how we were the children of disobedience and the children of wrath, meaning God exercised his wrath against us, and then it says in his great mercy, he saved us and he raised us. Do you see what the wrath did? He saved us. He raised us with Christ. Amen. So now we're going to finally going to get to talk about, uh, now that we have the right picture about God, because I don't know about you, but if you were raised like I was, you probably heard tens or hundreds of messages on intercession. And it kind of looks like this. It, it kind of is like God is somewhere far away, the Father. Okay, he is far away. And he's not really interested in us. And then there's someone praying a prayer here on earth and interceding in the name of Jesus. And you can hear all different variances of this. Either that Jesus takes your prayer and brings it to the Father and makes it beautiful. Or that the Father doesn't want to talk to Jesus or to us. He's not interested in us. Who are they to talk to me? And then Jesus says, oh, Father, but you forgot. You forgot I died for them. I shed my blood to the last drop. Listen, this really is bordering, if, not, if it's not blasphemy, for real. To say that after what Jesus did to bring us in to the family of God, to unite us with the Father, to make sure that there is no more separation between God and man, that we have been united. 
He shed his blood for it. He's done all that. And then for us to think that God somehow does not want to give us something that we should have or we need, or that God is ready to allow something to happen in our lives that really shouldn't because it's bad. But because Jesus reminds him <laughs> that he paid for it all, now God is willing to listen. Now, that, I'm, I'm telling you that that is not the understanding of intercession. Right. Let me read to you a text out of Hebrews chapter 7, verses 21 through 25. It says this, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. In other words, he's passionate or his wrath, in his wrath will pursue. And it says here, you are a priest forever, talking about Jesus, according to the order, order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Now this, he says that Jesus is the surety of a better covenant. You know why? Because the covenant is not made between God and us. Is made between God and Jesus. God and, as, and humanity, but Jesus assumed our humanity. I think it's worth explaining this here. When we talk about, you heard that people say Jesus died for us. Uh, how many of you know that? Okay. And we all say yes, and we get some benefits because he died for us. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus came and took our humanity in himself. And he is the representative of humanity. So Jesus didn't just die for you. He died as you. Are, are you listening to this? He died. In the, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14. If one died, then are all dead, that those that live should not live for themselves, but for him that died for them. So say this, Jesus didn't just die for me. He died for me, as me. And when he rose from the dead, he rose as me. Because he embraced humanity. You see this? He took humanity in himself, and he's never giving it up. The God of heaven came to dwell here, to go through everything that we go through. He knows what a baby feels like in the tummy of a mama. We may not remember that, but he does. He knows what a toddler goes through. He knows what it is to have breakfast. He knows what it is to sleep on a bed or on or whatever they had at that point in time. He knows he went through every single facet of our life that we go through. The Romans wanted taxes from him like they want today from us. So he could have given in to anxiety. Are you with me? He's, when you say, well, I don't know that you understand. Yes, I do, he says. I, I've been there. I've done that. I walked through it. Now listen, the God of the universe coming to become a human being, to, to be full on human, that is a, that's more than a miracle, it's a wonder. You know what a wonder is? It's something that passes your imagination. You can't even imagine that. It's a wonder that they crucify him and of the thousands Tens of thousands of people that they crucified. Remember, these were professional killers, crucifiers. Everyone, every single one of them would curse them while they were driving the nails. This is the only one that said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I tell you, that, that's a wonder in itself. To put someone in a grave... And for him to come out victorious, alive, and to know that he who is life went into death 
And when he came out, he cannot die again because when he rose from the dead, he killed death. Now that's a wonder. That is a wonder in itself. And our God is a God of wonder. Now, we know the work is finished, right? We know he died as us. He lived as us. And he rose from the dead as us. And then, look at this. Then the question is, well, it is finished. And no matter how you look at it, you cannot say any other way. The work is finished. But then the, it begs the question, what is Jesus doing now? That's important, right? I mean, yes, he, sit, he sat down in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Well, he didn't even start talking about intercession. But, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get there. Hopefully, if you give me 10 more minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll be... Will be there. So, this text that I, I, that I just read, let me just reread this for you. It says in verse twenty-five. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost, or completely. There's nothing that he cannot save, because. Remember, he is salvation himself. Salvation has a name, and the name of salvation is Jesus. Salvation is not just an act. Salvation is a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came into your life, he saved you to the uttermost. It says here, to save to the uttermost those that come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So what is he doing? Interceding, intercession. He lives to make intercession. Now listen, he left us a will, a testament. Now he is, what do you say when someone's in charge to make sure that the testament is fulfilled, the will is fulfilled? Is the executor, he's the executor of his own will. He is alive. He lives forever. And remember, I said that his attributes are unlimited, so he's well capable of bringing that to fruition. And what is he doing? He is executing the testament or the will that he has for you and for me. It says he forever lives to make intercession for those that came to him. That's why he is the way. The only way to the Father, right? Because he is the only one that could create this relationship. Now let me read to you out of Greek, the, the dictionary, what it means in Greek to intercede or intercession. It says, I meet, I encounter, I call upon, and then I make a petition. Most people stop at I make a petition. They took the one, two, three, four, the fourth meaning of the word and translated it as supplication or prayer. Where in reality, intercession has very little to do with prayer. And if it does, it's not like, let me, let me give you an example. I was near Riverwalk the other day with my wife. We had a date. We went to this nice restaurant. We walked out. And we, I saw someone in the wheelchair. I thought I, I wanted to give him some money, and he was asking for money. And I, I kind of, I felt like I should give him something. See, he was asking. He was supplicating. But he was supplicating from the perspective that he does not have any right. And that's not... It, it, he was basically appealing to my mercy. Uh, are you with me? So I didn't look at it that way, but that's kind of, I think, what he felt, right? But listen, when you go to the bank, or I go to my bank, and I go and put a request for a withdrawal, there's a different attitude. I don't ask for something I don't have. I don't go to the teller and say, would you have mercy on me today? 
I need to withdraw $1,000, $100, $50. I just say, uh, okay, I, I need to withdraw this amount. And they'll ask you what account you want it from, right? But there's a different way of asking. It's not the same. You don't ask because you don't have. You just know you have it, and therefore you ask for it. So it does involve a little bit of that. But when I talk about meat, how many of you understand that to set up a meeting, you can set up a meeting for many reasons. Uh, Shane, you know that, that you, you set up a meeting with clients or, or put people together. That's really brokerage. That's what it is. You, you bring people together for the purpose of conversing, for talking, for accomplishing a certain task. Right? So that would, be, that would be what an intercessor is, to bring people together. So if you look at Jesus, he always intercedes for us because he's always bringing us to the Father. He always reminds us that we're in him and he is in the Father and we're one. This is what intercession has, this is the meaning of intercession. And he lives to do this. Now, it means to, let's see, to, to meet, to encounter. When you, when, when you encounter God, there are many encounters in Scripture. Remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4? I mean, she has an encounter with Jesus. He's telling her everything she's done without any condemnation in his voice or in his heart towards her. And she drops her jar, he, she, her jug of, the jug of water, she runs to the city and tells him, come see a man that told me everything I've done. Is, could this be the Messiah? So she was transformed. Well, look at, look at uh, Matthew. He's sitting there at the tax office. And the Jews were spitting what they were going by, and, and his name was called in the synagogue every Every Sunday that he's beyond saving and, and the Jews would give him the look, but it was not the right look. It was a look of hatred. Uh, even the parents could not look at him anymore because he was a traitor of, the, of his own people, of his own religion. And he joined the Romans for money. He was an extorter. That's kind of how they, he was looked at. And then Jesus shows up and Jesus gives him the look. But this is a different look. This is the look of love. And it only took one look from Jesus for Zacchaeus, to, Zacchaeus too, but uh, for, for Matthew to drop everything that he had. He gets into Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus had an encounter with Jesus. He goes, I'll give back four times if I've done wrong to anybody. Are you kidding me? He's done wrong to a lot of people. But Jesus is not asking him. He had an encounter with the Lord. And that's what intercession is. It's an encounter. Blind Bartimaeus receives his, his sight. If you will, intercession is when life meets death, death is canceled. When sickness meets, meets health, who is Jesus, sickness is canceled. When uh, oppression and depression and anxiety meets Jesus, peace cancels out all of the other things. That when unforgiveness meets Jesus, right? Then forgiveness takes its place. This is what the real meaning of intercession is, and this is what Jesus is busy doing this forever. Okay, so it says here, this is an encounter. Um, to light upon a person or a thing, uh, to fall in with, to hit upon a person or a thing. So, basically, is God focusing on you. God putting his gaze on you and pursuing you is, if you will, is 
the wrath of God, pursuing you and pursuing me. It is, intercession is to go on and meet a person, especially for the purpose of conversation, consultation, and supplication. So when you meet a person, listen to the purpose. The purpose is for conversation and consultation. That's what intercessory intercession is. There are, it, it has many, many meanings, right? But watch this. It says this. It is like one who links his arms with you to face your battles. That is intercession. And that's what Jesus is busy doing. Whatever battle you're going through, he says, I'm here with you. My strength is your strength. My power is your power. My wisdom is your wisdom. I'm here. You, this is not your problem. It's our problem. And we'll face it together. That's intercession. That's what Jesus is, be, uh, is busy doing. It's not just something that he's done. The work is finished. But he's busy implementing that work. Now, if that's not the case, then we have no hope. All we have is history, that he's done something. But when you have a living Savior, when you have a living God, when you have someone that is so able, like the great I am, that has unlimited power on your side, then there's no, there shouldn't be any worries. Amen? The other meaning, one more meaning of intercession would be that he comes to carry your burdens. An intercessor is someone that carries your burdens. So that's not, how can I say this? All that he does, he, he takes your burdens upon him. He already took it. But he, in the present time, is letting you know this burden is not yours. It's mine to carry. This, you're going to love this one. And I, with, with this, I will, I will get to a closing. But um, the root word, the root word means this, to strike, hit the bullseye, spot on. Okay? What does that mean? It says, accordingly, it is used in classical Greek as the antonym of hamartia, to miss the mark or to sin. So what does intercession mean in Greek? It, re it really is the antonym or the exact opposite of hamartia. Hamartia would be to miss the mark. What was the mark? I read it in the beginning. He chose us to be adopted into his family. Sin would be to miss that mark, not to know you're one with God, not to know you're part of the family of God and Jesus is alive today and he lives in you and he lives to enforce that covenant. He lives to enforce. In other words, he has taken our humanity in him. He lived like us. He died as us. He rose from the dead as us. And now we can live the way we were created to live. We can live dependent on him, united with him, part of his family. And what is he doing? Whenever you miss the mark, whenever you tend to forget that he is your family, that he is your brother, then God is your father, that the Holy Spirit is within you. He is there to remind you. That is hitting the mark every single time. He, in, in other words, fulfilling the purpose of God for us every single moment of our life. How can I explain this? It's, it's, I know I've been in, in Keris Bible College, and, and there was a teacher there that he don't, no longer teaches at Keris, but it was a very in-depth teaching, and he was teach, teacher. He was teaching in, uh, about in, in the book of Romans, right? And he was taking a specific passage that talks about justification. 
and he was proving from the tense in Greek. And he said, the closest that I could come with, uh, his name was Don Crow, right? And he was teaching this, and he was saying, listen, if I take, and now he took a whole lot more time than I can take, but he was, he was saying this. He said, in Greek, the tense that it's used, the closest that we can come in English with is the present continuous tense, meaning it happens as you speak. There's no lapse, there's no delay. The moment this happens, this happens. So it, it, it's like simultaneous. Are, are you following what I'm saying? So the minute you miss the mark, Jesus justifies you. Jesus hits the mark for you. He is there to fulfill that. That is his purpose. That's what he is busy doing now. You miss, you forget he is your brother and God is your father. He's there to make sure that you remember that. He's there to fix that for you. Well, to start with, everything is fixed in the realm of the spirit. So he enforces that. Are you with me? So isn't it powerful to know that we have an intercessor as Jesus, as the God Almighty, the God of the universe, as the Savior, the one that saved us, the one that died as us and rose as us. And this, his mission, his intercession is not, his intercession is not to, uh, to separate you, his intercession is to make sure that you are united with him. Amen? So, what are we saying? Intercession is not you begging God, me begging God, to do something for us that, we, that he doesn't really want to do. Intercession, it really is Jesus bringing us to the Father. Setting us, setting up a meeting to where we're transformed, giving us an encounter with the real God, uh, performing uh, for us what we cannot perform ourselves, meaning hitting the bullseye every single time, hitting the purpose that God has for us every single moment of our life. I don't know if I could bring any better news than this. No, for real. Knowing that he forever, this is what Hebrews uh, 7, 25 says, that he forever lives to make intercession. In other words, this is the passion of his life. This is the mission of his life. This is what he does now. In case you wondered, what is Jesus doing now? What is he doing? He is interceding. He makes sure that the purpose of God for us is fulfilled. He makes sure that we come to the meeting with the Father. He makes sure that He takes our burdens and He faces our problems. You're not alone. And again, you don't have today. You don't really have to beg God for stuff. You already have it. And remember, just like you go to the bank to make a withdrawal, you already know how much you have there. You already know. Now, the good thing is that everything is provided by Jesus. There are no limits to what he provided. But he is not, I have that I have. He is the I am that I am. He is the source of every good thing. And no matter how much you draw, don't worry. Hey, you're not going to make the, the lights of heaven dim, right? You're not going to make God say, well, that, this is way too much. Why are you asking too much now? No way. That's not the case. Amen. It's not like the Father doesn't want to listen to you. Well, you and I may forget, well, you, you know, who he is, what he's done, that the fact that he's done it as us but he's always there to intercede for us. Now, what does intercession mean? It's one that sets up a meeting, right? Uh, 
You may remember, maybe someone introduced you to your wife. That is, that person was an intercessor. Maybe someone introduced you to, uh, for a business meeting. That is an intercessor. But more than that, Jesus lives to make sure the testament he provided, he left us, his will is fulfilled. And the main purpose, remember this, the main purpose in life for us is to be part of the great family of God. To know that God is our daddy. To know that Jesus is our brother. And to know that they are here active today. See, if, not, we only, if, if we don't believe that, then we only have history. But when we pray, we believe that we already have it. Why? He's provided all. He has given all to us. And now we know we have backing. The one that is almighty, that has all the strength that this universe has ever seen or will ever see. The unlimited strength of God, the power of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the joy of God. They are all unlimited. The peace of God is unlimited. It, it, it passes all understanding. This is who our God is. And you're going to say, yeah, yeah, but does he love me? Are you kidding me? You're the apple of his eye. You are the bride and he's the bridegroom. You are a pearl of great price that has the imprints of the blood of the Lamb of God. Since you were born, He draws you. He, he brings you in. You are a treasure hid in the field that He gave all that He had to have you. You are the lost sheep, but the lost sheep value is the value of the shepherd. He was willing to give the life for you. Listen, the encounter that that the prodigal son had with the love of the father. Do you remember that passage? I'm not worthy. This is religion. I'm not worthy. Take me as your, one of your hired servants. The father goes, are you kidding me? Come here. Let me hug you. Come, bring the rope. Do, do all this for him. That was an encounter. Now, that's, that was intercession right there. Intercession between the mindset that this person had and the reality of the God uh, of God's love for us. That's what happens when you have an encounter. You see Jesus for who he is. You see God for who he is. You start seeing your oneness with him. You see the one that always, always fixes whatever needs to be fixing. You want to say, Pastor John, aren't you, are you giving a license to sin? Are you really looking for a license? No. No way. Right? We're just, it's just sad that so many people live such a stressed life. So many good Christians, born again believers, they live under their privileges. They still live as beggars when they are people of the house of God when they have been provided with everything that they need. Father, I come to you, Lord, and I, I pray today that more than my words could convey or any example that I gave today, that by your Spirit you convince us that Jesus, our Lord, forever lives to make intercession, to bring us to you, to take our burdens, to carry them, to face our problems and our difficulties, to set up meetings between, between our, our problems and His divine power. Lord, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you that the good news is that we are your family and the purpose that you have for us is to be part of your family. Lord, help us to live as kings in your kingdom, as children in your home, as sons and daughters of yours, Father, as the ones that have been born from above, the ones that have the DNA of heaven, the ones that depend totally on you. Lord, I want to thank you for the wonderful intercessor that we have in Jesus. And we give you honor and we give you praise this morning. Amen.
I don't know about you, I'm happy. So <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I take that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. God is a good God. Remember, we have the enforcer of the covenant. A better covenant. Because he's your representative. He made it. No one can break it. Unless Jesus does. And he made up his mind. He's not going to. Amen. Amen.